In this video, we're gonna turn this boring sphere into this 3D illustration using Blender. Looking at sculpting, modeling, retopology, rigging, texturing, and all that other fun stuff. Now, before we get into it, I did just wanna quickly mention that I am currently running a monthly 3D challenge over on Patreon. Now, it has started for everyone that subscribes to me, and I'm gonna keep it that way, but you can subscribe for free. So, if you wanna get involved in the challenge, you're probably a little bit late for this month, given we're already more than halfway through. It's a fun theme this month, though. It's angels and demons, so if you did wanna have a crack at it, feel free to have a go. If you wanna get involved, Jump over there, subscribe for free if you need to. With all that said, let's crack on with the sculpt. So, this was day one. It was the 19th of March, 2024, and I spent about one hour and 45 minutes. And I started this, but like I do any other piece, by building up a mannequin. And what I mean by that is that I build up the character using super simple shapes, as you can see here. And what this does is helps us find the proportions of our character. Then as we progress, we'll gradually merge the shapes together like I just did here with the upper and lower torso. And then moving on from this, I then make marks on the torso where I'm expecting to see bony landmarks. So you can see that I'm marking out the rib cage, the clavicles, the pelvis, and the spine as well. But ideally, you wanna progress the whole sculpt together and not get bogged down in any one area. So I continue making the rest of the mannequin. Now, as I make the arms, notice that I generally keep these shapes very low poly. Remember, we're trying to make super simple shapes and lower poly naturally means simpler shapes. By the way, if you're interested in an easy to follow step-by-step -step guide on how to put together this mannequin, then check out episode one of my running series on how to sculpt a stylized character in Blender. The Mythic package includes seven video lessons, 52 reference images, the mannequin project files, along with a finished character scene file for those that want to dig in and check out how it was put together in Blender. But back to the sculpt, I merge the arms with the torso and continue making marks to indicate anatomy underneath the skin. Now at this point, I'm not just thinking about bony landmarks, but the muscles and fat pads as well. And even though all of these marks won't actually be visible in the final result, so what it does is allow me to better understand the forms and proportions as we progress. Kind of like creating a sketch in 2D. You know, you want to use light pencil marks in the early stages while you're constructing the character. But in the final result, these generally get erased. Not all the time, but usually you're going to erase these construction lines in the end. It's something like that. Then as the sculpt progresses, I'll gradually smooth away marks and push it more and more towards the style that I'm trying to achieve. And this is why, even when you're creating stylized characters, you still need to know realistic anatomy because stylized characters are just a simplified version of realistic characters. It's realistic forms pushed in the direction of aesthetically pleasing geometric shapes. And how far away you deviate from realism has a big impact on the style that you're trying to achieve. I'm happy with how the body looks for now, so I start working on the head. Now, similar to the body, I start off by creating super simple shapes to help establish some proportions. And notice I'm also, again, staying super low res at this stage. Now, staying low res not only makes the object easier to control, but it also forces you to think about the big overall shapes and not get bogged down in the details too early. And remember, we're laying down the foundations for the rest of the head here. So you want to take your time and make sure that you get it right. I created the ear by adding in a cube and pushing it into the rough shape. And the ears are really useful to help you find other proportions of the head. So don't leave it too long to add them to your character. Once I found a shape that I like, I then added a mirror modifier and continued working on the rest of the head. Again, if you want a step-by-step -step guide on how to do this, I do have a course, which I'll link below, on sculpting a stylized head, where I make this process as simple and streamlined as possible. And I also take you through retopology, texturing, rigging, a bit of hard surface modeling as well. So it is worth a watch, in my opinion. Though I would say that. Although it's got good reviews. If you're sculpting an open mouth, it's useful to have something to indicate the teeth in there because the mouth wraps around the teeth. Now, in the past, I've just added a cylinder and there's nothing wrong with doing that. But since I've got a teeth asset now, I just use that. Now it's very common for your sculpt to look pretty strange at this point. 
try not to worry too much about it. Sometimes you just become a little bit blind to your mistakes and all you need is a little break from it. Your eyes just need a rest and you'll be amazed at how many mistakes you spot when you come back to it. And that's exactly what I did here. I shut Blender down and then I came back to it the following day. The next day I got back to working on it with fresh eyes. Speaking of which, I added in some eyes using the Danny Mac Eye Designer add-on. This is an add-on that I created a few years ago for adding in very quick eyes that can be adjusted in various ways, which you'll find linked below. But eventually I do hand paint this for a less procedural look. Since the texture on these eyes are only visible in rendered or material preview mode, I set up a physical light as well. Though it's worth pointing out that I generally don't sculpt in material preview mode. For the eyelashes, I used the Speed Retopo add-on to draw a shape directly onto the model. I then added a solidify modifier to give the shape thickness and a subdivision modifier to make the shape cleaner. Using modifiers where you can is a good idea because it's a non-destructive workflow, meaning I can always edit the thickness or remove subdivision levels later if I need to. Now for the retopology, I decided to cut some corners by importing a previous model that already had good topology and started to shape it around the sculpt. The idea behind this is that once we have good topology in roughly the same shape as the sculpt, we can then add a shrink wrap modifier which will make the good topology stick to the surface of the sculpt. The tricky part though is matching the new mesh to the sculpt, which is why I do it in stages. And so here I'm working on the head, but then later on I'll do the same thing for the torso, arms, and any other part that I've sculpted. It just depends. Now, I don't actually mind doing retopology from scratch. I actually quite enjoy it, but this method does seem to be a little bit quicker. But if you're considering doing it yourself, just be aware, it does actually take quite a bit longer than it looks. For the hair, I inserted a sphere and started pushing and pulling it around into the base hair shape. I add color to the hair early because it's nice to see the piece coming together as you work. And I would recommend that you do the same because seeing it come together gives you confidence in whatever you're working on and that confidence motivates you to keep going with it. Now I've got loads of half finished models that just got shelved because I lost confidence in it. So doing little things like adding color to the hair or putting the eyes in like this goes a long way in my experience. Now in this scenario, I started the fringe using curves and usually what I would do is create a base like I've done to the top. And I think I do actually come back and restart the fringe later because this is going straight into what I'd call the second pass. You know, the first pass being the overall shape and the second pass being the hair strands. And when you go straight in with the second pass, it's a lot more difficult to find that big overall shape. So in summary, I don't know what I'm doing here and I don't know why I chose to do it this way but I do come back and correct it in a bit. What is acceptable though, is to use curves for the overall shape of the pigtails, which is what I did here. And then, yeah, as I said, I came back and started shaping out the fringe properly. And once I've got some basic shapes down, I do also tend to do a little sculpting pass using the clay build-up brush to indicate the directionality of the hair. Now in most cases, this won't actually be seen in the final render because it gets covered with hair strands, but I do it because it helps me lay the hair strands later. And then finally, I indicate the bobbles using a couple of Taurus primitives. Nothing fancy at all. The next day, I decided to stop putting off the inevitable and started to add fingers to the hands, which again, is something that I teach in the mannequin episode of my running course on how to sculpt a stylized character. Once I had the first basic mannequin finger in place, I can then duplicate it and resize it to create the other fingers. I also duplicated a finger to start shaping the thumb. And if you try this for yourself, just remember that the thumb has one joint less than the fingers. Otherwise, you're gonna have a very funky looking thumb. I then merged the digits into the hand and started working on it. Now hands are pretty tricky to sculpt, so take your time and make sure you look at reference. And remember, you've always got reference right here in front of you. Once I found a shape that I like, I then finished off the retopology using pieces of the same mesh from earlier, which again, I do in stages. So I did the torso first, followed by the arm and hand. And since I separated the arm from the torso, I then bridged the topology to make it one piece again. I can then repeat this for the head and attach it to the neck. 
Once it's all together as one piece, I then again add a shrink wrap modifier so that it conforms to the sculpt underneath, and then a multi-res modifier so that I can add subdivision levels. The result we get is the sculpt is now a mesh with clean topology and subdivision levels. Then it's just a case of cleaning up any issues that might have arisen in the process, using the lowest subdivision level to make big overall changes, and the highest subdivision level to make changes to the smaller details. To make the dress, I again use the speed retop or add-on, and I use the body to essentially draw the top half of the dress directly onto the character, and then extruded the skirt section out. Now at the moment, the dress is all one piece, but because I've created a belt around it, it means that I can separate the skirt from the top section because the belt will hide it. And the purpose of doing this is that the skirt will be much easier to model if it's a separate piece because the design I've got in my head for this is quite complicated, so it's gonna need more resolution than what's going on in the top half. For the necklace, I just added in a simple curve and moved it into position. I mean, the idea at the time was that this is just going to be a proxy necklace and I was going to replace this with a better looking one later on, but in the end I ran out of time and I did actually just leave it like this. But you know what? It still looks alright. The following day I got to work on that skirt which, as I say, got separated from the dress. Now modelling the skirt was a long, slow, tedious process of moving points around to create a complicated shape. Now since I know some of you will ask why I don't just simulate the cloth, the problem I have with that is you're handing over the control to the computer, whereas if you do it all by hand, you get full control over the design of the cloth. Although there is a bit of give and take because obviously doing it all by hand like I am here takes a long time. So looking back at this, I think a better approach might have been to maybe find a skirt that's already pre-made in a similar style to what I'm going for and then push and pull the points around from there. Or you know, maybe even simulate a skirt and then adjust it from there. I'm not sure, I'll have to think about this for future projects. But to protect my sanity, I didn't do this all in one go, so I come back to the skirt at various points throughout the project and improve on it gradually as it goes along. After spending so long working on the skirt, I could feel my motivation waning, so I pushed the project along by adding a camera and some lights and start pushing it closer to its final look. And to get a better idea of how the final image will look, I need to pause the character, so I got to work on a simple rig. If you're working with a symmetrical character, like I am here, you only need to add bones to one side, then Blender will take care of the other for you. Now I didn't bother rigging the individual fingers because I'm just trying to get a feel for how the final result might look just now. But in hindsight, I think I probably should have just took the time to rig the fingers here because without the hands in the final pose, the whole thing just looks a little bit off. So that's another thing I need to remember for next time. But I did take this as an opportunity to work on my anatomy while the arm is in pose, since she was modelled in a neutral position, whereas her arm now is bent and pronated. So the muscles and bones in this pose look and behave a little bit differently to how I originally sculpted them. For the fingers, I used the pause tool in sculpt mode to bend them into place. But as I say, I think it would have been better to take the time to rig these fingers properly because pausing them in sculpt mode is a destructive workflow, whereas pausing them with a rig would have allowed me to play with a few different ideas quite easily. Now this took a little bit of time, but once I'd found a pose I was satisfied with, I then cleaned up the anatomy using my other sculpting brushes, like I did with the arm. For the moon in the background, I found a royalty free moon texture online and wrapped it around a simple sphere. I was able to create a bloom effect quite easily in Eevee by turning on bloom, nice and easy. But to achieve the same effect in cycles, I added a glare node in the compositor and then played with the settings. Next I started to lay hair curves over the base hair created earlier on in the project. Now as with the skirt, this is a long and tedious process. But if you take your time to get it right, and I mean really take your time because this takes ages, you can get some really nice results. And again, I go into this process in a lot more depth in my stylized head course which you'll find linked below. And then disaster happens and this is seemingly typical for my projects these days. I run into this crazy mesh problem. Now I think it's something to do with pausing the character 
and then sculpting on that pose character all while using a multi-resolution modifier. I think a combination of these things play into creating this mess, but I'm not sure of the exact cause of it. So if you do, if you're aware of what might be causing this problem, please do let me know in the comments because it's been driving me nuts for about, I don't know, two years now. I could really do with figuring out why this is happening. Now to model the branch in the background, all I did was just use a simple curve and then colored it brown. It's gonna be quite hidden away anyway, so I don't need it to be perfect. And then what I can do is just duplicate these curves a few times to add a bit of randomness to the branch before adding leaves to it. Now I achieve this by using the import images as planes add-on and then importing a leaf texture, which again, I found online. And I'll duplicate this a bunch of times to fill out the branch. Now ideally, I would have a few different shapes to this leaf to avoid it being too repetitive. But since this is mostly just a background element that will barely be seen, I'm expecting that I'll get away with it. Especially because I do add a bit of variation through scaling, rotating, and then also using the sculpting brushes just to tweak the shape a little bit. Because I didn't retopologize this model from scratch, the model that I used to wrap around the sculpt already had UVs, which is a nice time saver. However, when I was wrapping the model, I did use the mirror modifier a couple of times just to make sure it was perfectly symmetrical. And what this does to the UVs is essentially flattens them on top of each other. So the left side is folded on top of the right side, essentially. And what that means is that any texture that we create for this model is gonna be perfectly symmetrical on either side, which generally speaking, isn't really what you want because it can look a little bit uncanny. However, another problem that I have here is that this pause has now been locked in. You know, I've applied the rig and I can't unpause it. So I can't use the power of symmetry to make UV this character a lot easier. So it would take double the time to UV it essentially. And I'm kind of running out of time at this point. So I just decide that I'm just gonna leave the UVs as they are, push this project forward and move on and hope that nobody notices. So with the hideous UVs in place, I started painting the model. Now, I know I just said that I can't paint asymmetrical because the UVs are boxed. However, right now I'm painting on the vertices and since the character is paused, I have no choice but to paint asymmetrical. But when I bake this paint down to a texture, down to its UVs, it will be perfectly symmetrical. And I'm not sure if it's gonna bake from left to right or right to left. I'll just have to find out. Not to future self. Don't make this mistake again. It is a massive faff. Next, I set about painting the eyes. Now the texture from the eye designer does look nice, but I wanted a little bit more control over the final look. So I painted the iris and pupil instead. And the way I did this was I created a gradual transition from dark to light down the iris, and then painted the pupil over the top. I then linked this material to the other side so that I didn't need to paint it twice. Now, as we approach the end of this piece, I just go around the model checking each section looks all right. I'm just doing lots and lots of little tweaks at this point. Now, there is a lot that I'm not really happy with here, but I have deadlines for getting this out, which I need to stick to, which is useful for me because otherwise I would be noodling this for like the next six years. But I do take the opportunity to add some finishing touches too, such as, individual eyelashes and earring and wrinkles in the shirt and so on and so forth. Just all the little bits that make it just that little bit better before sending it off to render. Now before we see the final result, as always, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe for future content. And don't forget to get yourself involved in the Danny Mac 3D challenge. It's just started, this is the first month. As I said at the start of the video, the First theme is angels and demons. I'm excited to learn what next month's theme is because I don't actually know yet, but hopefully it'll be something as fun and challenging as this month. So yeah, check that out using the link below this video. And until the next one, have fun sculpting.